Okay, this video is about insights in psychotherapy. Sort of, it's gonna incorporate a whole bunch of different things. Some of the history of psychology, of psychotherapy, of understanding human behavior and different counseling methods, and what things seem to have worked and been helpful. So it'll all fit together uh, once we get uh, through it. Okay, so the first thing is this painting here is called Faust on Easter Morning. It was from the story of Faust, you know, written by Goethe, and there's other versions of it as well. And basically, he was this big shot professor who felt that his life was meaningless and he was about to commit suicide. And then he looked out the window and he saw all these happy families and it reminded him of his own childhood when he was happy. And that gave him hope that maybe better times would be around the corner so he would decide not to commit suicide and to try to find meaning and purpose in his life. Okay, so there's a quote by Dostoevsky that goes with that. Fyodor Dostoevsky, you know, the Russian writer, lived in the 1800s. He said, some beautiful sacred memory preserved since childhood is perhaps the best education of all. If a man carries such memories into life with him, he is saved for the rest of his days. Okay, so what that's all about is Fyodor Dostoevsky was in a concentration camp. He was almost executed by the Tsar. And he had the experience of observing who lives and who doesn't, who has inner resilience and who doesn't. And so uh, some happy memories from childhood was a big positive. And we're going to talk about some of the other things that make a person more resilient. Okay, some insights for psychotherapy. The purpose of this lecture to help you to uh, better advise yourself and perhaps other people too. Okay, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. My father was a psychiatrist, but you know, I've been a doctor 30 years. A lot of people come to me for advice. So some of the things I've learned over the years, and I've studied the subject pretty extensively. Okay, up until about 1900, people would usually just talk to their family or a friend or a priest. Uh, really, uh, patients having a lot of difficulty with sometimes be thrown into a mental hospital. Um, it's good to talk to your parents because your parents, you know, they love you and because you know them, you understand where their advice is coming from. When you don't know the person you're talking to, it can be hard sometimes to understand where their advice is coming from, to put it into perspective. After 1900, Sigmund Freud's method of psychoanalysis grew in popularity. Uh, Freud, you know, he lived up until 1939. Um, but it was a different view of uh, humanity. He felt that humans did not have free will. They didn't even have a soul. Religion was a neurosis. He felt that humans were controlled by subconscious desires like the Oedipal complex, which Freud says means that boys want to have sex with their mothers. I think that's ridiculous. So did a lot of other uh, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists. For example, I can remember the first time I had orgasm. I was playing basketball. The ball got stuck between the rim and the backboard. I was in sixth grade. So I had to climb up the pole, shimmy up there to get the ball. And I'm like, all of a sudden, wow, that felt good. What was that? I didn't even know what it was. How could I have imagined having sex with my mother if I didn't even know what it was? I mean, it's ridiculous. Okay. And also, I talked to guys ever since I was little. We talk about girls and women all the time. Nobody ever remotely talks about that. And so... I think it's entirely bogus, okay? Freud turned his back to the patient and told them to tell him everything, to freely associate. Uh, quite often, the problems would be blamed on other family members, especially the parents. And again, I think that's ridiculous. Like, encouraging people to denounce their parents, I mean, that's in some ways kind of evil. And it's developing a victim mentality to fixate on the past and blame other people rather than to sort of accept your life, accept responsibility for your life and try to move forward and do something positive to make your life better. It also required lots of repeat visits, was very expensive for the patients. Carl Krauss, uh, another uh, mental health expert of those days said, psychoanalysis causes the disease it pretends to cure. That was pretty much my, my, my impression from studying psychoanalysis. I especially read about it more recently in this book by Thomas Shaw's called The Myth of Psychotherapy. It's a good book. This guy, Shaw, is like a genius, but, you know, I don't always agree with what he says, but he's a brilliant guy. Um, all right, uh, next thing. Um, Freud actually would recommend electric shock treatment for frigid housewives. That was an interesting thought. Uh, Freud's protege, Alfred Adler, disagreed with Freud, blaming everything on repressed sexual desires, the unconscious mind. And he felt that a lot of social factors were major shapers of feelings and behavior. Um, 
Alfred Adler was especially famous for the inferiority principle. And, you know, I've talked about it in a previous video about Alfred Adler. Basically, a person is sad that they're failing in something they cared about, so they overcompensate by putting more effort in something else. They sublimate their energy, if you will, into something else. And that can be a very good thing. Uh, Thomas Shaw's comments on Adler and Young that they were an improvement on Freud, but they didn't go in far enough. The key is meaning. It is meaning that sets people free, according to Thomas Shaw's. And we'll come back to that because uh, that's actually a very big topic. But we've got a little more history to go through first. Uh, Carl Jung, another protege of Freud, he disagreed with Freud in the sense that he thought religion was more important than Freud did. Although Jung himself was not overtly religious, he recognized, in his opinion, religion was a basic need for most people. Uh, Jung was also became famous for developing the concept of archetypes, collective unconscious, individuation. The idea of individuation, you know, being your own best self, developing yourself in whatever ways you think are true and best, uh, that had been largely developed by Kierkegaard in the 1800s. And later it was more refined, the concept, by Abraham Maslow and others. I've got separate videos on Kierkegaard. Uh, the next school of psychology to become very popular was behaviorism, as developed by B.F. Skinner in the mid-1900s. Skinner was a brilliant Harvard guy, but he was also kind of a jerk. Skinner believed that everything a person does practically is just conditioned by their context of rewards and punishment. Um, and he basically figured, hey, given that, all we got to do is manipulate people and we can get them to do anything we want. And, you know, kind of like Freud, Skinner believed that people did not have free will and you know, he developed his techniques from training, you know, rats and pigeons. He didn't even care how the brain works. All he cared about is, look, this gets them to do what we want them to. This prevents them from doing what we don't want to. That's all that matters. So Skinner just cared about controlling behavior. And I was reading about the history of psychology, and I came across Skinner and the Skinner box that he had developed for putting an animal in a cage and then rewarding it let's say with its food or seeds for the pigeon and then punishments like shocks. And at first I was kind of thinking, you know, this is ridiculous, the Skinner box, you know, for these dumb animals. What does this have to do with me? And then I realized, oh my God, the family home is like a Skinner box and my wife is a trainer and I'm the dumb animal. Nagging sex, nagging sex. <laughs> so anyways. Okay, next big uh, psychology, psychotherapy person to come along was Carl Rogers. Um, and his version of psychology, he called it client-centered therapy with unconditional personal regard. And he believed that people were inherently good. Um, and he tried to provide a supportive conversation where he let the patient just solve their own problem, just give them a sounding board. And he didn't really have a specific model or standard of what to go by. He sort of just let the patient figure it out for themselves. He was basically providing supportive psychotherapy. And he was very popular. He was a super famous guy, his books, his research. But he did stir up enemies. The psychoanalysis were pissed off that he was, in a sense, they felt trying to refute them. So were the behaviorists. There was a competition for who was going to be the dominant psychology theory in that day. Um, other people mocked his work, like Hans Eisenach, he was a researcher, he said, psychotherapy is just the prostitution of friendship. And Eisenach said, you know what, the more psychotherapy a person goes to, the less the recovery rate. He felt that it wasn't doing any good at all. Now, there's certainly plenty of ways to dispute that. And, you know, for example, I'd give it credit that people, a lot of people don't have any intelligent friends. They come from stupid families, they got stupid friends, and they don't have anybody they can really talk to, or you know, they just feel out of place. And so they really need you know, some intelligent person they could talk to. And a lot of times, the intelligent person is just sort of helping them along to work through their thoughts so they can you know, truly figure it out for themselves. But they need that help, and they also need to be able to talk out loud. Uh, some people just can't talk to themselves, you know. I actually think talking to oneself is good when you're trying to solve problems. You know, walk and talk for studying, but also when you're thinking through a problem, that sometimes is useful. Okay, Abraham Maslow came along, you know, 1950, 60, 70. Uh, he really sort of emphasized the concept of self-actualization and had this easy-to-understand pyramid of needs to build up to self-actualization. Uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy was developed by Aaron Beck and David Burns. Um, and in a sense, that's a little bit like the Shakespeare method of saying there's nothing 
either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. It's basically, you reassess your your basic judgments, your values, your your premises, and a lot of times you can come up with realizing, well, gee, you need to look at things a different way, and that's a very intellectual way of doing things, but that can sometimes work quite well. Okay, David Burns wrote the famous book, Feeling Good About Cognitive Therapy, so he's Dr. Feelgood. Um, the biological psychiatrist would counter by saying, well, hold on a sec, all this talk stuff is nice, but it doesn't actually help the really sick patients. Sometimes there's no obvious problem in their life, no reason for the patient's sadness. It's like Jonathan Swift, you know, from the 1700s who said, you can't reason a person out of something they weren't reasoned into. But the problem with biological psychiatry is that in general, their pills don't work. They're therapeutically impotent for the most part. They can, you know, get a short-term result. You know, they can give an antipsychotic to a psychotic patient and that'll calm them down, but potentially at the risk of brain damage, especially if you give that drug for a long time. And long-term, all their drugs tend to cause brain damage, according to a lot of psychiatry experts like Grace Jackson and multiple others. Um, and then quite often when the studies are looked at carefully, like, you know, the psychologist, researcher, Kirst looked at all this stuff, they usually don't do much better than placebo, if at all better than placebo. Long-term patients who stay on the pills tend to do worse than the patients who don't take any pills at all. And I realize there might be some special exceptions to that. I uh, have a friend of a friend whose friend was, you know, becoming psychotic, and the only thing that sort of calmed him down was antipsychotic medication. So there is sometimes a role for that. But the benefit overall of psychiatric medicines is grossly exaggerated, grossly exaggerated. Um, I actually think from having studied biological psychiatry, it's probably the worst field in all of medicine. Um, okay, well, what other options are there? You know, I think, for example, um, it's been pointed out in one study, the suicide rate doubled in patients who received antidepressant medications, but it was decreased by 50% approximately in patients who received psychotherapy. Therefore, in that study, antidepressants had a four times higher suicide rate than did psychotherapy patients. So that's a big benefit from psychotherapy relative to the antidepressants on that one. And then the question arises, well, what other options are there? What else can be done for a person? And how a person views their life is very important. So Arthur Schopenhauer from the 1700s, early 1800s said, a happy life is impossible. The highest a man can achieve is a heroic life. The best source of happiness comes from who the man is. That's the idea of get outside yourself, be the best you can be, and you'll be happiest that way because you'll be focusing on what you're actually doing rather than obsessing about your past or something like that. So I, I like that quote though, a heroic life is the best a man can hope to achieve. Um, Dostoevsky said something similar, the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Okay, so we're getting back to the idea of if a person can find meaning and purpose in their life, they become stronger, more resilient, less likely to be overly saddened by some other event. There's suffering's inevitable. <laughs> you can't get away from the fact someday your parents are going to die, someday other people you care about, you love are going to die, and other sad things are going to happen. But at least if you're going forward and doing something positive, helping other people, or doing something good for you know, your family, your religious organization, whatever you're involved in, you can then sort of you know, make some sense out of it. Create something good despite the, the sadness that, that, that you can't escape in human life. Okay, um, Viktor Frankl, he wrote a very good book about man's search for meaning, and here's his quote. Man's search for meaning is the chief motivation of his life. Once an individual's search for meaning is successful, it not only renders him happy, but gives him the capability to cope with suffering. Okay, Viktor Frankl from the mid-1900s, he was in concentration camp during World War II, and he observed who survives who, and who doesn't, who handles it well and who doesn't. And so that's an important point, because we're really talking about a big difference here. You're talking about Maslow and Jung emphasizing individuation, developing your individual self, being true to yourself, what you actually really care about and want to do. And I actually think, of course, that's a good thing as far as it goes, but what's sort of being said here by Viktor Frankl, Dostoevsky, and Shaz is that you need more than that. You, you, you need, you know, maybe your purpose in life, make sure it has meaning. And that meaning can come from helping other people. It can come from doing something that you think is great and wonderful. Um, but meaning is real important. Um, if a person suffering, they feel it to be meaningless, that their life is meaningless, that's more difficult for them to endure their suffering. Their pain just comes out of no purpose and they're more sad. 
A that's why atheists are more likely to commit suicide. You know, the Dr. Harold Conan book has shown, you know, having a religion is, has a big improvement in people's health. All kinds of positive things happen in religious communities. That's why all the Blue Zone uh, populations, the most centenarians and people over 90 that were healthy, you know, they all had some form of religion. Quite often it was a very important to them. The longest lived people were the Seventh-day Adventists, Loma Linda, California. And, you know, for example, the old surgeon Wareham, you know, he said it's their lifestyle is very important why they're so healthy and live so long. It's more than just a diet, although the diet, of course, is very important, a plant-based diet. Um, okay, so we've got the point. You know, increasing the meaning of our life, the purpose of our life, helping other people, that makes us more resilient. But is that all there is to it? And I'll just share with you some other perspectives on where does meaning come from. Um, it can come from loving relationships. I think that's very important. You know, if a person loves their spouse, loves their significant other, loves their child, or loves some group, they're the coach of a team, or, you know, whatever it might be, they're a teacher, whatever it might be, just something that makes them excited to get out of bed in the morning and help other people, that can give more purpose to their life. That can help them counteract whatever they're sad or depressed about or anxious about. Um, and I've seen that save people's lives. Um, another thing people sometimes say to themselves, I sometimes say this to myself, or I joke with my friends. I say, well, I feel like I'm half screwed in life, but most people are really screwed. So I consider myself lucky. Count my blessings. And, you know, that's like count your blessings and attitude of gratitude. And that helps. Um, I think you need at least one thing you're excited about as positive when you get out of bed in the morning in order to sort of stay strong and resilient. Um, and it can come from a relationship with God. Before the 1960s, when atheism was rare in the United States, suicide was very rare, okay? Um, as, uh, as atheism has become a lot more common, so has suicide. That's, you know, potentially, I think it is strongly related. Um, I've seen a lot of atheists become drug addicts, all kinds of bad stuff. Okay, um, Alcoholics Anonymous has better results when the alcoholics trade alcohol for God. It's almost like not just an abstract thing. Alcohol is bad for my brain, therefore I shall drink no more. It's more like they change the purpose in their life instead of finding their happiness from alcohol. They're going to find it from uh, helping other people or from, you know, becoming more religious. That can help people. Um, so that was a, a big thing. The ones who became religious, they did a lot better in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's an interesting subject if anybody's curious to read about it. Um, Jesu Christu said to an adulterer, go and sin no more. So he's almost like saying you have to change your purpose, change your focus in life. And I remember like my first year at Stanford when I was in college, I was real sad. I got injured as a wrestler. My wrestling career really wasn't going anywhere fast. And I wanted to drop out of Stanford, come back home, go to some local college. And my mom said, give it a try for one year and just be the best student you could be. Someday you're going to be a great doctor. And I'm like, oh, God, or scientist. And I'm like, that's what I added, scientist. She just said doctor. But I said to myself, okay, Mom, I'll give it a try for one year. I'm going to become a learning machine. And it was almost as if I took all that sadness, you know, like the Alfred Adler inferiority principle and put it into, well, someday I'll become a great doctor. And so I had incredible energy after that. I could study all day long, day after day, month after month, year after year. And it was that transformation in my mind uh, that changed everything. And I was, you know, happy for the opportunity then. Okay, no more alcohol, not one drop, no more cigarettes, not one. So this, again, is almost like a conversion moment. And that conversion moment um, gives a person the strength to carry, few on, carry through on their commitment. Okay, um, religion can also provide a strong moral foundation. One of the problems with some of these psychology you know, theories is they can't tell you anything. What's right? What's wrong? Where does your moral foundation come from? You know, how do you... Uh, envision what is a good life, what is a good person. Um, and, you know, here's one quote from Richard Gans. I'll show you what this book is from, Psychobabble, uh, about analysis of different theories of psychotherapy and what helps people. And in this author's conclusion, he felt that the Bible is an uncompromising in its moral boundaries, and because of this, it is a trustworthy standard of behavior. Um, another good book was Soteria. And Soteria has nothing to do with religion. It was just taking schizophrenics and giving them a residential home to live in and um, they got much better outcomes than the patients that were on long-term antipsychotics. Uh, this book here, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Whitaker, is also a really good book on, more it emphasizes problems with bi biological uh, psychiatry. This book here, I don't know if you can see it, it's called Psycho Psychological Seduction by Kilpatrick. 
surprisingly good view, good book. Um, he's a big proponent of religion to help uh, people with mental health problems, and he feels that it gives them a major boost in their purpose in life and really helps them. Okay. So the question arises, can psychology alone without religion be able to provide a moral foundation or meaning? And, you know, there's more to life than a moral foundation or meaning. Well, first of all, too, the person has to get up in the morning, take care of themselves, you know, put their clothes on, eat a meal. They have to get along with their family if they live with their family. And ideally, you'd like them to be able to work. You'd like them to be able to have, you know, an uh, intimate relationship with, uh, find a, a partner in life, or at least friends or maybe a romantic partner. Those are things that bring a lot of happiness to life. So those are some basic goals a person can have. But, you know, that might be enough for a lot of people, certainly. But other people will want more. They'll want a bigger cosmic sense of what they want out of life. Okay, you know, for example, I just do this as a hobby. But, you know, part of like, why do I come out of it? Because I always wanted to be a great doctor. As a clinical doctor, you have to kind of do a lot of rote stuff. And I saw this as an opportunity. Plus, I saw on the Internet there was such a lack of anybody really uh, explaining to the public what's going on with health. You know, McDougall did a fantastic job of having a good, rational way to put things all together. I think, you know, I have a different background. I'm able to put a few other things out there that'll help, hopefully, and so that's why I'll do this. I mean, it's just a hobby. It's not a business. I'm, I kind of have fun with this. Um, but I sort of see that as one purpose, and that energizes me to do this stuff. You know, there's no money in it, but it's good, and I know it's good. And also, I know the textbooks, medical textbooks, they're a joke. I was first in my class out of 333 students, and I got 99s on my boards. I know those textbooks back and forth. They're a joke. And so to take knowledge forward, somebody should do that to sort of help the public and to help doctors and other people that take care of patients. So that's what I kind of try to do with this. And you find the same thing when you dig into subjects. There's often like this common conventional way of doing things and quite often it's totally backward and stupid a lot of times a hundred years or more out of date or simply ineffective or simply a scam a ripoff system so what I'll try to do is find what's good and, and share that with people you know look at my tiny audience okay I get like a hundred views per video and I know that all the nonsense high fat dyes and all this other nonsense will have millions of net views between all the people promoting that but it's good to have something, you know, true and good for people. So I feel like this is worthwhile. A couple quotes, too. Um, so if modern psychology is confused, and don't go along, I know a lot of psychologists, and I like the vast majority of them. The vast majority of them, I know they try hard, and they want to help that patient. Um, so I think the vast majority of the ones I know are good. But there's also, I've heard plenty of bad things about psychologists. I can tell you, I've heard guys who say that their psychologists were trying to get them divorced or trying to, you know, milk money out of them through the custody things and that it was a big scam as part of the divorce system. So there's good psychologists and bad psychologists, but I certainly know there are a lot of good ones. And but there's other questions arise is, you know, how can they provide meaning in life? OK, how can they give you a right and wrong sense? At least they feel some people say the Bible does that and maybe it's better in that sense. Other people say, oh, modern psychologists can't even tell you the difference between a man and a woman. How are they going to solve more complex problems in life? You know, and what about the importance of the family, the respect for these relationships? Because you can get into people uh, whose work like B.F. Skinner, he basically felt people should not even have families. They, they, children should not be raised by their parents. And Plato said something similar. So you have to watch out. There are persons in the psychology field who don't even want families to be together. And I think that that's a big mistake. Families provide a lot of happiness in life. They support each other. They like each other. They love each other. And that's very good. So I'd also tell you, if you're listening out there, just watch out for, you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to break up families. And I think that's bad. I mean, families are little units of happiness in a big, complex world. Okay, uh, so here's a couple quotes. And also, by the way, anybody can tell, you know, the difference between their mother and their father, a man and a woman, their sister and their brother, okay? That shouldn't be such a difficult question. All right, here's a quote from Bing Crosby, you know, the singer from the 1900s. The unity of the family is the unity of the nation. Kids behave better when they've got relatively intact families. You know, their, their father is watching them, their mother's watching them, keeping track of them, trying to keep them out of trouble, trying to get them to be nice and behave well. Okay, here's Father Patrick Payton. Um, he's from the mid to late 1900s. He was pretty famous. He said, the family that prays together stays together. And that's been shown. That's true. Okay, William Kilpatrick from his book here, the Psychology Seduction book, he said, Christianity has better psychology than psychology itself. 
And his take was he felt that the psychology of having role models in a story where a person can insert themselves into this cosmic drama of trying to be, you know, a source of good in this complex world where many bad things happen, that gives more meaning to their life and purpose and makes it clear to them what they should do, you know, to emulate other heroic persons. Okay, so here's a quote by Will Durant, the great American historian. He lived uh, from 1885 to 1981, a long life. He's written a whole bunch of books. I read a whole bunch of his books. Anyways, here we go. This is what Durant says. The Gospels are the greatest drama ever told. The redemption of fallen man by death of his God. The philosophes, you know, the French philosopher, atheist philosophers like Voltaire and Diderot and Rousseau, they don't need religion, but the average man wants it. Religion tells him his life is meaningful. Without religion, the average guy is like a poor chump who just gets abused by life and has bad luck. Religion helps increase his sense of meaning in his life and make his life a lot happier. I've known a lot of poor people who were very happy with the role that religion played in their life. Okay, uh, you know, Most people can't be a great athlete or a rich businessman or a scholar. They really can't do much in terms of worldly description of achievement, so to speak. But they can be a wonderful father, mother, sister, brother, parent. You know, they can do all kinds of wonderfully good things for the people in their life. Um, so they can, leave a, they can lead a very positive, good, useful, helpful life. Okay, so continuing with Durant's quote, religion tells him his life is meaningful. The atheism of the philosophers leads to despair for the average man. Voltaire and his philosophes they wanted to keep morality and get rid of theology. But civilization depends on morality, and morality must be taught in childhood. For a child to learn morality, it must be taught with theology. So Will Durant continues, all Western civilization is dying because it has lost the religious basis of its moral code. 